The sons of Noah who came out of the ark were Shem and Ham and Japheth. Ham would become the father of Canaan. Who was Ham? Ham had two brothers, Shem and Japheth, along with their father, Noah. They were the rare survivors of a massive flood that eradicated all other human beings. Noah was the man whom God had chosen as uniquely good and upright among everyone else. This happened when the Nephilim were becoming prominent. Genesis chapter 6, verse 9. These are the records of the generations, family history of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, one who was just and had right standing with God, blameless in his evil generation. Noah walked, lived in habitual fellowship with God. God decided to cleanse the corrupted earth through a great flood and chose to start anew with Noah, his wife, their sons, and their sons' wives, plus a pair of every kind of living creature, both male and female. Noah constructed the ark and boarded it with his family and the animals as the rain started pouring down. All living beings that remained on land perished. The Holy Scriptures declare, only Noah survived along with those with him inside the ark. When the floodwaters finally receded, God summoned Noah and his family, including his son Ham, to leave the ark with all the animals. God blessed Noah and his sons and established a sacred promise with them. He encouraged them to spread out and fill the earth and vowed never to devastate it again with a flood. He placed a rainbow in the sky as a tangible sign of this promise. Noah's sin and shame. After these events, Noah began a new chapter the Bible narrates that Noah cultivated a vineyard, made wine, and encountered problems. He consumed too much wine for exceeding what he could handle at his age and became intoxicated. Genesis chapter 9, verses 20 through 22. And Noah began to farm and cultivate the ground, and he planted a vineyard. He drank some of the wine and became drunk, and he was uncovered and lay exposed inside his tent. Ham, the father of Canaan, saw by accident the nakedness of his father, and to his father's shame, told his two brothers outside. Ham himself may have been caught drunken and scolded by his wise father before. Thus, he might have felt satisfied seeing his father in a similar state. People who stray often find joy in the mistakes of others. Yet, those who genuinely regret their wrongdoings can't take pleasure in others' missteps. Ham's second mistake was sharing this news with his brothers outside in public, mocking their father to make him look foolish. It is deeply improper to treat any sin as a laughing matter. Proverbs chapter 14, verse 9. Fools mock sin, but sin mocks the fools. But among the upright there is goodwill and the favor and blessing of God. It is wrong to be proud of things that should make us feel sorrowful instead. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 2. And you are proud and arrogant, you should have mourned in shame for that the man who has done this disgraceful thing would be removed from your fellowship. Let us understand this. It is utterly incorrect and morally unacceptable to expose or broadcast the faults of others, especially those of our parents, to whom we owe our utmost respect and honor. Noah was not just a remarkable man, but also a righteous man. Revealing his mistakes in such a public manner was an utterly ungrateful act. Ham survived the flood by his father, but now only his ingratitude shows. In this context, Ham is referred to as the father of Canaan, which serves as a significant reminder. Being a father himself, Ham should have demonstrated a greater level of respect and reverence towards his own father. However, Shem and Japheth did the opposite. Their actions contrast sharply with Ham's, offering a clear moral distinction between showing respect and dishonor. Genesis chapter 9, verse 23. So Shem and Japheth took a robe and put it on both their shoulders and walked backwards and covered the nakedness of their father. Their faces were turned away so that they did not see their father's nakedness. They didn't just refuse to look at it themselves. They also made sure nobody else could, teaching us to be kind when it comes to other people's mistakes and embarrassments. We shouldn't join with those who point fingers or spread gossip, but instead... We should try to cover up these faults, or at least see them in the best light. Treating others who we'd like to be treated. Remember, we're supposed to cover everyone's errors with a blanket of love, 
as we're taught in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 8. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 8. Above all, have fervent and unfailing love for one another, because love covers a multitude of sins. It overlooks unkindness and unselfishly seeks the best for others. We should also show respect towards our elders and those in authority by not exposing their faults. If Ham's wrong action is similar to the original sin in the Garden of Eden, as other signs in this story indicate, then we can search for what these two events have in common to understand better. This doesn't mean Ham's mistake is precisely like what Eve did, but we can find a way to compare them. Let's start by noticing something important. Both Eve and Ham were misled by what they saw. Eve looked at the fruit and wanted it because it seemed reasonable, and Ham looked at his father without clothes. Was he tempted by what he saw? Moreover, Eve and Ham seek to entice others to join them in the offensive act. Adam succumbs, but Ham's brothers resist. In the Garden of Eden, there was an established food boundary through which we can see that Eve's sin was related to the blessing, which entailed the provision of food. Eve was confronted with that food boundary and chose to cross it. She then persuaded Adam to cross it as well. When Noah woke up and realized what his sons had done, he blessed Shem and Japheth for their respectful actions. However, he didn't curse Ham directly. Instead, he cursed Ham's son, Canaan. Genesis chapter 9, verse 25. So he said, Cursed be Canaan, the son of Ham. A servant of servants, he shall be to his brothers. The man is overcome by the spirit of prophecy and predicts his son's futures, similar to Jacob's prophecy before he died. Genesis chapter 49, verse 1. Then Jacob called for his sons and said, Assemble yourselves around me, that I may tell you what will happen to you and your descendants in the days to come. In this passage, a curse is pronounced upon Canaan, who is the son of Ham. Ham himself is cursed, either because Canaan was more guilty than his siblings, or because Canaan's descendants were eventually driven out of their land to make way for Israel. Here Moses records the animating story of Israel during the wars of Canaan. Despite the Canaanite strength, Noah had foretold their doom. The particular curse is that he shall be a servant of servants, meaning the meanest and most despicable servant, even to his brethren. Those who were once his equals by birth shall become his lords by conquest. This curse certainly refers to the victories that Israel had over the Canaanites. As a result of these victories, the Canaanites were either put to the sword or put under tribute. This did not happen until about 800 years after this curse was made. Judges chapter 1, verse 33. Neither did the warriors of Naphtali drive out the inhabitants of Beth Shemesh or the inhabitants of Beth Anath, but they lived among the Canaanites, the inhabitants of the land. And the inhabitants of Beth Shemesh and of Beth Anath became forced labor for them. Note that often the sins of fathers are visited upon their children, especially when the children adopt their father's wicked ways and do nothing to stop the cycle of evil. It is important to note that those who bring shame and dishonor upon others, particularly their own parents, deserve to be shamed themselves. A disrespectful child who mocks their parents is not deserving of the title of son, and instead should be treated as a hired servant, or even lower as a servant among their own siblings. Divine curses may take some time to have an effect, but they will eventually come to pass. Despite being under the curse of slavery, his family had dominion for a long time. This shows that a family, people, or individual may be under God's curse and still prosper for a while until their iniquity reaches its limit. Many who are destined for destruction are not yet ready for it. Therefore, don't envy sinners in your hearts. It is worth noting that in the story, a blessing is bestowed upon Shem and Japheth. It is important to understand that both blessings and curses have two common elements. Firstly, their impact is often not limited to the individual and may extend to families, tribes, societies, or even entire nations. This is similar to what we see in the story of Cain. Secondly, once a blessing or curse is enacted, it can persist from one generation to the next until something occurs to nullify its effects. Many blessings and curses noted in the Word of God in connection with the patriarchs have continued to operate for nearly 4,000 years and are working today. 
The second aspect of blessings and curses has practical implications that are significant. The generation that is cursed might face repetitive situations or patterns of behavior that can't be solely explained by their personal experiences or life events. The root cause of such situations might go back to ancient times, even thousands of years ago. The Bible mentions generational curses in several places. The Bible contains both blessings and curses, and most of the curses in it are the result of someone cursing another. For instance, Noah cursed Canaan, the son of Ham. When Ham saw him naked and drunk, words play a significant role in both blessings and curses, whether they are spoken, written, or kept internally. The Word of God has a lot to say about the power of words. The Bible warns us about how we use our words, whether for good or evil. For example, Proverbs chapter 11, verse 9, With his mouth, the godless man destroys his neighbor. But through knowledge and discernment, the righteous will be rescued. The reason why Noah cursed Canaan instead of Ham is not entirely clear. Bible scholars suggest that seeing his father's nakedness was considered a grave disrespect, particularly because Ham did not make any effort to rectify the situation. In fact, he even disclosed it to his brothers. Some scholars believe that Canaan might have played a role in the disrespectful act possibly even witnessing Noah in his vulnerable state, or that Canaan was very important to Ham, which is why Noah directed his curse at Canaan, someone Ham cherished. There are also thoughts that seeing him naked could imply something much more severe, suggesting a sinister deed that Ham, Canaan, or both might have inflicted upon Noah, such as causing him harm or engaging in an immoral act. Additionally, some interpret that since the phrase Uncovering nakedness is associated with intimate wrongdoing in other parts of the Bible. It could mean that Ham committed an indecent act with his own mother, potentially leading to Canaan's birth. In any case, Ham showed disrespect towards his father, Noah. As a result of Ham's actions, Noah pronounced a curse not directly on Ham, but on Canaan, Ham's dear offspring. What does it mean to uncover nakedness in the Bible? Before humans made mistakes in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve didn't wear clothes, and this was completely normal for them. However, after they did wrong, being without clothes became something they were embarrassed about. Indeed, feeling embarrassed about being unclothed was the first effect Adam and Eve experienced due to their mistake. From that point on, being naked was associated with matters of intimacy, personal space, and feeling exposed. Whenever the Bible talks about revealing nakedness, it typically means some form of improper act, wrongdoing, or disrespect. The earliest story about exposing someone appears in the story. The expression, uncover nakedness, is typically used to talk about acts of lustful immorality. In the more recent translations of the Bible, this phrase is often changed to, have intimate relations with. Leviticus chapter 18, verse 17. You shall not uncover the nakedness of a woman and her daughter, nor shall you take her son's daughter or her daughter's daughter to uncover their nakedness, have intimate relations with them. They are her blood relatives. It is an outrageous offense. Certain verses like Deuteronomy chapter 22, verse 30, clearly instruct a man not to have relations with his stepmother because it is an act of disrespect towards his father, described as uncovering his father's nakedness in the Bible. When a man engages with the woman who was with his father, he brings shame upon his dad. Deuteronomy chapter 27, verse 20. Leviticus chapter 18, verse 8. Ezekiel chapter 22, verse 10. This wrongdoing is exemplified by Absalom, King David's son, highlighting the gravity of his offense. 2 Samuel chapter 16, verse 22. In a bold and disrespectful move, Absalom openly declared that he was involved with his father's concubines. This action was more than an invasion of his father's personal space. It was a direct affront to God's explicit command. Cursed is the man who lies with his father's wife as he violates the sanctity of his father's bed. Deuteronomy chapter 27, verse 20. Five facts about curses. Number one, curses are charged with supernatural power. To the casual observer, Human life appears to be a chaotic mix of light and shadow that is not organized in any tangible pattern and is not governed by any clear-cut laws. Yet, there are elements that an overwhelming majority of people are unaware of. 
The Word of God makes it abundantly evident that the forces of curses and blessings are at play. So, curses and blessings are words that are charged with supernatural power. Maybe the power of God, perhaps the power of the devil. These are words that intrude upon lives and, to a large degree, determine their destiny. Number two, the first curse in the Bible was just 200 years earlier than the curse of Canaan. Most people are surprised when they learn that the Bible contains several examples of curses. Given that the word curse appears about 200 times, it is clear that this is an important matter for us to investigate. The Word of God begins with God Almighty pronouncing a lot of cursing. We don't get three chapters into Genesis before seeing God Almighty's curse. God gave a command to Adam while he was living in the Garden of Eden. God's command was not to eat of a tree called the tree of the knowledge of good and evil because he warned on the day they ate of that tree, they would surely die. Genesis chapter 2 verse 17. However, Eve eventually succumbed to temptation and ate from the forbidden tree after being deceived by the serpent. Because of this, God placed the first curse in the Bible on the serpent. The first curse in the Bible was on Satan. The third fact about a curse is, there is no curse without a cause. The way blessings and curses work is not random or hard to predict. On the contrary, both operate according to eternal, unchanging laws. It is to the Bible once again that we must look for a correct understanding of these laws. In Proverbs chapter 26, verse 2, Solomon shows this principle concerning curses. Proverbs chapter 26, verse 2, Like a sparrow in its flitting, like a swallow in its flying, so a curse without cause does not come to rest. Number four, God used the curse as a punishment. After the punishment of Cain, we read, Genesis chapter four, verse 13, Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is greater than I can bear. Number five, the invisible realm. The forces that determine history fall into two categories, visible and invisible and history is shaped by how these two realms interact. If we only pay attention to things we can see and touch, we will run into events and situations that we can only partially explain or control. In the visible realm, all the normal objects and events of the material universe can be found. Even though events often do not follow the course we would like, we feel comfortable in this realm. Many people's awareness does not extend beyond their immediate surroundings. Yet the Bible opens the door to another, invisible realm, which is not material, but spiritual. Forces continuously and decisively influence events in the visible realm and the supernatural realm. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 17 through 18, he describes these two realms. For our momentary light distress, this passing trouble is producing for us an eternal weight of glory, a fullness beyond all measure, surpassing all comparisons, a transcendent splendor and an endless blessedness. So we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are unseen. For the things which are visible are temporal, just brief and fleeting, but the things which are invisible are everlasting and imperishable. As far as the visible realm is concerned, all things that are part of it are transitory and impermanent. Only in the invisible domain can we find true and abiding reality. In this domain, we also see the forces that will eventually shape our destiny, even in the visible realm. Paul makes it clear that success in life hinges upon being able to apprehend and relate to that which is invisible and spiritual. Both blessings and curses belong to the invisible realm. They are carriers of supernatural spiritual power. Blessings produce excellent and beneficial results. Curses have bad and harmful effects. Both are central themes of Scripture. The words, blessings, and curses are cited in the Word of God more than 640 times. He blesses Shem, or rather blesses God for him, yet so that it entitles him to the greatest honor and happiness imaginable. Genesis chapter 9, verses 26 through 27. He also said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. May God enlarge the land of Japheth, and let him dwell in the tents of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. Look closely, for he names the Lord as the God of Shem. And truly blessed, wonderfully blessed, are those people whose God is the Lord, 
as stated in Psalms 144, verse 15. Every possible blessing is contained within this truth. This very blessing was granted to Abraham and his descendants. The God of the heavens felt honored to be known as their God. Psalm 144, verse 15. How blessed and favored are the people in such circumstance. How blessed, fortunate, prosperous, and favored are the people whose God is the Lord. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 16. But the truth is that they were longing for a better country that is a heavenly one. For that reason, God is not ashamed of them or to be called their God, even to be surnamed their God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. For he has prepared a city for them. Shem is rewarded for his respect towards his father, as the Lord bestows upon him the honor of being his God. This honor is more than enough reward for all the services we offer and the sufferings we endure for his name. He gives glory to God for the good work that Shem had done. Instead of blessing and praising Shem, who was the instrument of the good work, he blesses and praises God, who was the author. This serves as a reminder that all credit for any good work, whether done by ourselves or others, must be humbly and thankfully attributed to God, who works all our good works in and through us. When we see people doing good work, we should glorify not them, but our Father. Matthew chapter 5, verse 16. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good deeds and moral excellence, and recognize and honor and glorify your Father who is in heaven. So, when David praised Abigail, it was as if he were also giving thanks to God for sending her. It's a real honor and a special privilege to work for God and to be used by Him to do good deeds. Similarly, Noah predicted that God would treat Shem and his descendants so well that everyone would see that God was truly Shem's God. Many people would then give thanks to God for this. Blessed be the Lord God of Shem. Moreover, Canaan would end up serving Shem he shall be his servant. Remember this, if you have the Lord as your God, he will give you as much honor and influence. He also gave a blessing to Japheth and said, through him, in the distant lands where Japheth's descendants would live, God shall expand Japheth's territory and he shall live alongside Shem. Japheth is blessed with the riches of the land. God will increase Japheth's land, his descendants and his territory. Japheth's descendants have filled Europe a large portion of Asia, and possibly even America. Remember, we must recognize God in every growth and expansion we experience. Shem receives the blessings from heaven. God will reside with Shem's descendants, meaning that Jesus will come from Shem's lineage, and through his family, the church will thrive. Now, it was time to split the birthright between Shem and Japheth, as Ham was no longer considered. Both Shem and Japheth would share the leadership, but Canaan would serve them both. Japheth receives a double portion, indicating significant expansion from God. However, Shem is granted the spiritual role as God will make his home with Shem's family. Truly, being with God is far more valuable than any material wealth. Living humbly with God is far superior to living in luxury without him. In Salem, where God's presence is felt, there is greater joy than in all the wealthy places without him. Thirdly, both have dominion over Canaan. Canaan shall be their servant. When Japheth unites with Shem, Canaan falls before them both. When strangers become friends, enemies become servants. What eventually happened to Japheth and Shem? After the great flood, Japheth and his siblings truly did increase in number and spread across the earth. Japheth was blessed with seven sons, and their names were Gomer, Magog, Madai, Javan, Tubal, Meshech, and Tiras. Genesis chapter 10, verse 2. The sons of Japheth, Gomer, Magog, Madai, Javan, Tubal, Meshech, and Tyrus. The descendants of Japheth were made up of different groups who lived by the sea, like those mentioned in verse 5. The family also included the Persians, Greeks, Romans, Scythians, and Macedonians. Japheth's family grew and spread far across Asia and Europe. They even reached North America by establishing colonies. This growth matched what Noah had foreseen for Japheth, which was a great expansion. Shem, his brothers, and their wives obeyed God's instruction to refill the earth with people. Shem's family tree gave rise to many groups. The Assyrians and Chaldeans from what we now know 
as southern Iraq, the Elamites, Arameans, Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Arabs, and Hebrews. The term Semitic comes from Shem's name. Shem's great-grandson, Eber, is where the Hebrew name originated, connecting to figures like Abram and the Jewish community. For more details on Shem and his descendants, you can refer to Genesis chapters 10 and 11. As time went on, Shem had numerous offspring. He lived a long and full life, eventually dying at the age of 600. Genesis chapter 11, verses 10 through 11. These are the records of the generations of Shem, from what Abraham descended. Shem was a hundred years old when he became the father of Arpachshad, two years after the flood. And Shem lived 500 years after Arpachshad was born, and he had other sons and daughters. Shem is mentioned in the New Testament as an ancestor of Jesus. Luke chapter 3, verse 36. The son of Canaan, the son of Arphaxad, the son of Shem, the son of Noah, the son of Lamech. Apart from being the father of Cush, Mizraim, Phut, and Canaan, the Bible offers no further information about Ham. In a few instances, it refers to Egypt as the land of Ham. Psalm chapter 78, verse 51. He killed all the firstborn in Egypt, the first and best of their strength in the tents of the land of the sons of Ham. Many preposterous statements have been made, such as black or African people descended from Ham. The idea that black or African individuals come from Ham is incorrect. The Bible clearly does not state that black or African people are from Ham. When Noah cursed Ham's son to be a servant, he did not talk about his race at all. Furthermore, when the Bible refers to Egypt as the land of Ham, it is not making any statement about race. It's important to recognize that the Israelites, who were descendants of Shem, Ham's brother, ended up being slaves in Egypt themselves. This shows that the narratives in the Bible do not connect these events with race. Why is it important for us to understand this? It is important for us to understand the story of the curse of Ham, also referred to as the curse of Canaan, so we can comprehend the value of respect, particularly respecting one's parents. Although, we may not fully understand why Ham's act of seeing his father naked was considered a sin. What he did was wrong and resulted in a sin against his father. Ham could have covered his father, as his brothers did, but instead, he chose to tell others about what he saw. This was not a kind or respectful way to treat his father, and Noah was upset when he found out, hence the curse. Honoring our parents is a crucial value for God's people. In the Ten Commandments that God gave to Moses, one of his commandments was to honor your father and your mother so that you may live long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. Exodus chapter 20, verse 12. What's interesting about this commandment is that it comes with a promise. If you do the right thing, all will go well for you. Even when our parents don't deserve honor, we should still honor them. This is similar to what Jesus taught us when he said to love our enemies and pray for those who persecute us so that you may show yourselves to be the children of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on those who are evil and on those who are good, and makes the rain fall on the righteous, those who are morally upright, and the unrighteous, the unrepentant, those who oppose him. Matthew chapter 5, verse 45. It is essential to recognize the significance of how we treat people. We have a moral obligation to love others, show respect and care for them whenever required. Moreover, we must understand that our sinful actions not only affect us, but also those around us. Ham's behavior towards his father was inappropriate and caused him harm. As a result, Noah cursed Ham's son and possibly future generations as well. It is essential to recognize the significance of how we treat people. We have a moral obligation to love others, show respect and care for them whenever required. Moreover, we must understand that our sinful actions not only affect us, but also those around us. Ham's behavior towards his father was inappropriate and caused him harm. As a result, Noah cursed Ham's son and possibly future generations as well. The Hidden Sins of Sodom and Gomorrah Abraham had left his father's house on God's command and had left with nephew Lot. Abram and Lot were forced to split up one going one way and the other, the other. One might expect Abram, the recipient of God's promise, to exercise his right and choose first, but he graciously gave Lot the first choice. 
Lot made his decision based solely on human considerations, contenting himself with the fat of the land. Abram's decision to let Lot choose first was undoubtedly a faith-based decision, with Abram focusing on things spiritual, that is, God's promise, rather than things temporal. Lot's decision was completely selfish, and he left Abram and went to Sodom. Lot looked up and saw the entire Jordan Valley Plain. This valley was lush and fruitful, well watered, and resembled the Lord's garden. Lot pitched his tent near Sodom, where the men were wicked, greatly sinning before the Lord. Later in chapter 19, their wickedness is revealed. Lot is contrasted with Abram. Abram was instructed to raise his eyes and look, which Lot did on his own. Three men visited Abraham near the great trees of Mamre at Hebron. Now the Lord appeared to Abraham by the oaks of Mamre while he was sitting at the tent door in the heat of the day. When he raised his eyes and looked, behold, three men were standing opposite him. And when he saw them, he ran from the tent door to meet them and bowed down to the ground and said, My Lord, if now I have found favor in your sight, please do not pass your servant by. Please let a little water be brought and wash your feet and make yourselves comfortable under the tree and I will bring a piece of bread so that you may refresh yourselves. After that, you may go on since you have visited your servant. And they said, so do as you have said. So Abraham hurried into the tent to Sarah and said, quickly prepare three measures of fine flour, knead it and make bread cakes. Abraham also ran to the herd and took a tender and choice calf and gave it to the servant, and he hurried to prepare it. He took curds and milk and the calf, which he had prepared and set it before them, and he was standing by them under the tree as they ate. Then they said to him, Where is your wife Sarah? And he said, There, in the tent. He said, I will certainly return to you at this time next year, and behold, your wife Sarah will have a son. And Sarah was listening at the tent door, which was behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old, advanced in age. Sarah was past childbearing. So Sarah laughed to herself, saying, After I have become old, am I to have pleasure, my Lord being old also? But the Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh, saying, Shall I actually give birth to a child when I am so old? Is anything too difficult for the Lord? At the appointed time I will return to you, at this time next year, and Sarah will have a son. Sarah denied it, however, saying, I did not laugh, for she was afraid. And he said, No, but you did laugh. Then the men rose up from there and looked down toward Sodom, and Abraham was walking with them to send them off. The Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I am about to do? Since Abraham will certainly become a great and mighty nation, and in him all the nations of the earth will be blessed. For I have chosen him so that he may command his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice, so that the Lord may bring upon Abraham what he has spoken about him. And the Lord said, The outcry of Sodom and Gomorrah is indeed great, and their sin is exceedingly grave. I will go down now and see whether they have done entirely as the outcry, which has come to me, indicates. And if not, I will know. Then the men turned away from there and went towards Sodom while Abraham was still standing before the Lord. Abraham approached and said, Will you indeed sweep away the righteous with the wicked? Suppose there are fifty righteous people within the city. Will you indeed sweep it away and not spare the place for the sake of the fifty righteous who are in it? Far be it from you to do such a thing, to kill the righteous with the wicked, so that the righteous and the wicked are treated alike. Far be it from you. Shall not the judge of all the earth deal justly? So the Lord said, If I find in Sodom fifty righteous within the city, then I will spare the entire place on their account. And Abraham replied, Now behold, I have ventured to speak to the Lord, although I am only dust and ashes. Suppose the fifty righteous are lacking five. Will you destroy the entire city because of five? And he said, I will not destroy it if I find forty-five there. And he spoke to him yet again and said, Suppose forty are found there. And he said, I will not do it on account of the forty. Then he said, O oh, may the Lord not be angry, and I shall speak. Suppose thirty are found there. And he said, I will not do it if I find thirty there. And he said, 
Now behold, I have ventured to speak to the Lord. Suppose twenty are found there. And he said, I will not destroy it on account of the twenty. Then he said, Oh, may the Lord not be angry, and I shall speak only this once. Suppose ten are found there. And he said, I will not destroy it on account of the ten. As soon as he had finished speaking to Abraham, the Lord departed, and Abraham returned to his place. The Intercession of Abraham for the People of Sodom The central theme of this story is justice. It develops from the preceding verses. God is certainly capable of doing whatever he desires, but will it be just? The answer is obvious, as evidenced by his responses to Abraham's appeals. Interestingly, God had a dual motivation for revealing his plan. All nations would be blessed through Abraham. So God told them that one city, Sodom, would be removed before it could be blessed through him. Second, Abraham was to teach his descendants righteousness and justice, what is right and just, in order for them to benefit from God's blessings. If those people's sins were complete, they would be judged. Will God sweep the righteous along with the unrighteous? Abraham was convinced that there were righteous people in Sodom. So he appealed to Sodom based on God's justice. His intercession reveals Abraham's great character. He prayed that everyone in the cities, both the wicked and the righteous, be spared for the sake of the righteous. Previously, he had personally rescued these people during a battle. He now pleaded for them with the same boldness, perseverance, and generosity that he had fought for them. Some readers are perplexed by Abraham's bargaining with God. But despite their audacity, Abraham's prayers were delivered with genuine humility and profound reverence. He pleaded for justice, deliverance for Sodom if only 50, 45, 40, 30, 20, or even 10 righteous people were present. He was not attempting to persuade God to do something against his will. Lot's prayer for Zor, on the other hand, was quite the opposite. As a result, the theme of justice dominates those who will benefit from God's blessing. These truths should have concerned Israel as much as they did Abraham, who turned them into compassionate intercession. God and his holy righteousness scream out against Sodom and Gomorrah. Onlooking celestial beings cried out against Sodom and Gomorrah. The mass of sufferers of Sodom and Gomorrah's sin cried out against those metropolises. Effective prayer involved understanding who God is and how God operates in a given situation. Effective prayer is not a passive observer of what God does. Instead, it takes an active role and serves as a reminder to God through prayer. Abraham's concern for the people of Sodom and Gomorrah is quite remarkable. He could have simply prayed for his nephew Lot's safety, but he didn't. Instead, Abraham's heart was filled with sorrow and compassion, even for the wicked inhabitants of these cities. Abraham's persistence and intercession is truly remarkable and impossible to ignore. This is the kind of heart that God wanted to draw out of Abraham, a heart that cared deeply for people who were created in the image of God. Abraham worked tirelessly to intercede on behalf of a city that deserved judgment. This kind of heart is what a great leader of a large and mighty nation needs to have. After leaving Abraham, the two visitors mentioned in Genesis chapter 18 verse 22 arrived in Sodom. It is at this point that they are first identified as angelic beings, who had previously accompanied the Lord during his visit to Abraham at Mamre. Genesis chapter 19 verses 1 through 3. Now the two angels came to Sodom in the evening, as Lot was sitting at the gate of Sodom. When Lot saw them, he stood up to meet them and bowed down with his face to the ground. And he said, Now behold, my lords, please turn aside into your servant's house and spend the night, and wash your feet, then you may rise early and go on your way. They said, No, we shall spend the night in the public square. Yet he strongly urged them, so they turned aside to him and entered his house. And he prepared a feast for them and baked unleavened bread, and they ate. We have no reason to believe that Lot knew the nature of these guests. To him, they probably seemed like distinguished guests with an air of righteousness and morality about them. We see that Lot was sitting in the gate of Sodom. Lot's life was a gradual decline as he kept compromising. He went from looking towards Sodom, Genesis chapter 13, verse 10, to pitching his tent towards Sodom. Genesis chapter 13, verse 12, 
to eventually living in Sodom. Genesis chapter 14, verse 12. Unfortunately, he lost everything when Sodom was attacked. Now, after returning to the infamous city, Lot was seen sitting in the gate of Sodom, which indicate that he had become a civic leader. The gate area of an ancient city was like a community center where the city's respected leaders would come together. They would settle arguments, talk over important matters, and keep an eye on everyone coming in or going out of the city. Lot was a good and moral man who felt deeply troubled by the wrongdoing he saw all around him. 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 7 through 8. And if he rescued righteous Lot, who was tormented by the immoral conduct of unprincipled and ungodly men, for that just man, while living among them, felt his righteous soul tormented day after day by what he saw and heard of their lawless acts. Peter has already shared with us the story of how God saved Noah. Now, he tells us about another person God saved, righteous Lot. When we look at Lot's story, we can see that God is just as capable of saving people as he is of punishing them. This teaches us that God's kindness is just as strong as his sense of justice. He saved Lot because Lot was a good man in his eyes, even though others might not have recognized Lot's goodness. Despite being a good person, Lot lived in Sodom and Gomorrah, places filled with evil, and this troubled him deeply every day. He was disturbed by the sin around him, yet he didn't take strong enough steps to remove himself and his family from that bad environment. It shows us that it's not enough to be upset by wrongdoing. We must also take action to avoid being part of it. Lot made a big mistake that had serious consequences. He compromised his beliefs, and as a result, he lost the respect of his family and friends. They saw his actions and decided they couldn't trust him or his beliefs. This is why none of them were saved. It's a powerful lesson about the importance of staying true to what you believe in, no matter what. We also read something great about his insistence to help the angels. Lot was very insistent when he invited the visitors into his home. Usually, it was common to offer hospitality to guests, but the way Lot did it was different. He was extremely eager and urgent in his invitation. This shows us that sometimes, the way we do something can be just as important as what we are doing. Genesis chapter 19, verses 4 through 5. Before they lay down, the men of the city, the men of Sodom, surrounded the house, both young and old, all the people from every quarter. And they called to Lot and said to him, Where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us that we may have relations with them. The people of Sodom had no respect or consideration for their two guests. They ignored every rule of kindness and decency, driven by their own cruel and wrongful desires. We read, The men of the city, both old and young, all the people from every quarter, surrounded the house. This demonstrates that the whole city was engulfed in violence and immorality. It wasn't something out of the ordinary. Rather, it was a common practice among the men of Sodom. Later on in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 16, God expressed strong disapproval of Judah's significant wrongdoing during the later years of the divided kingdom. He likened Jerusalem to the old city of Sodom, calling them akin to sisters. God then drew a parallel between the wrongdoings of Sodom and the sins being committed in Jerusalem during that era. Behold, this was the sin of your sister Sodom. She and her daughters, outlying cities, had arrogance, abundant food, and careless ease. But she did not help the poor and needy. They were haughty and committed repulsive acts before me. Therefore, I removed them when I saw it. Ezekiel chapter 16, verses 49 through 50. The message we get from the Ezekiel passage isn't just listing the sins of Sodom, like being proud, lazy, or unfair to the poor, as the only reasons they face judgment. These were sins that Sodom had, but Jerusalem, another city, was guilty of them too. When we look at Genesis, it's clear that God was upset about more than just those sins. He was also deeply troubled by the terrible acts of sexual violence and immorality happening in Sodom. This phrase, committed abomination in Ezekiel likely includes these sins too. So, the lesson here is about recognizing and turning away from all kinds of wrongs, not just a few. We read that we may know them carnally. The sin of the men of Sodom was plainly connected to this. Lot bargains for the life and safety of his guests. 
Genesis chapter 19, verses 6 through 9. But Lot went out to them at the doorway and shut the door behind him and said, Please, my brothers, do not act wickedly. Now look, I have two daughters who have not had relations with any man. Please let me bring them out to you and do to them whatever you like. Only do not do anything to these men, because they have come under the shelter of my roof. But they said, Get out of the way. They also said, This one came in as a foreigner, and already he is acting like a judge. Now he will treat you worse than them. So they pressed hard against Lot and moved forward to break the door. We read, Please, my brethren, do not do so wickedly. Lot faced a tough challenge in getting his point across. He believed in a different sense of right and wrong compared to the men of Sodom. These men were chasing after what they thought was fun, paying no mind to Lot's warnings that their actions were wrong. This brings us to a crucial question. Without the Bible's direction on what is morally right and wrong in terms of our sexuality, what rules would we live by? It's clear that just following on our own desires isn't just a good enough standard. We read, I have two daughters who have not known a man, please. Let me bring them out to you, and you may do to them as you wish. Lot's decision to offer his daughters to the crowd was appalling and indefensible. The behavior of the Sodomites was a horrifying display of moral decay. Yet we find ourselves equally horrified by Lot's readiness to sacrifice his own daughters to satisfy the crowd. This appalling willingness mirrors the crowd's own reprehensible desires. To grasp the full gravity of this narrative, it's crucial to recognize the societal context of those times. Women were undervalued in the pre-Christian era, not afforded the respect and dignity they deserved. Conversely, the value placed on a guest's safety was extraordinarily high. Within this cultural framework, the protection of a guest was often prioritized above the well-being of one's own family members, reflecting a distorted understanding of hospitality and duty. This one came in to stay here, and he keeps acting like a judge. The men of Sodom mocked Lot and rejected his feeble efforts to provide moral and spiritual leadership. Perhaps Lot thought that, through compromise, he might have reached these men, but the opposite happened. They had no respect for him whatsoever, even though his friendly first approach led him to call such wicked men my brethren. Genesis chapter 19, verses 10 through 11. But the men reached out their hands and brought Lot into the house with them, and shut the door. Then they struck the men who were at the doorway of the house with blindness, from the small to the great, so that they became weary of trying to find the doorway. It must have taken significant, perhaps supernatural strength to do what the angels did at the door. Probably for the first time, Lot understood that his guests were more than men. The work of striking the blind men was supernatural. Now, the mob's physical blindness matched its moral blindness. The Angel's Deliverance of Lot Genesis chapter 19, verses 12 through 14 Then the two men said to Lot, Whom else do you have here? A son-in-law and your sons and daughters, and whomever you have in the city, bring them out of the place, for we are about to destroy this place, because their outcry has become so great before the Lord that the Lord has sent us to destroy it. So Lot went out and spoke to his sons-in-law, who were to marry his daughters, and said, up, get out of this place, for the Lord is destroying the city. But he appeared to his sons-in-law to be joking. The angels did not know everything. They did not know who all were in Lot's family until Lot told them. It shows us that even heavenly beings don't have all the knowledge. When the angels asked, do you have anyone else here? It was a reminder that we should care about the salvation of not only ourselves, but also our entire family. Lot had daughters who were engaged to be married, but were not yet married. When it was said, We will destroy this place, the Lord has sent us to destroy it. Lot found out for the first time what the angel's mission was, to destroy the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. Even though these cities were to be judged, God's intention was to save Lot and his family from the destruction. We read, He seemed to be joking. Let's understand the significant impact of Lot's life choices. Picture this. When Lot tried to warn his sons-in-law about God's impending judgment with deep concern and seriousness, they simply did not take him seriously. They just couldn't believe him. This belief meant that they, too, would face God's judgment without any escape. From Lot's life, we learn a crucial lesson. 
you can be saved and still lead a life that amounts to nothing of value. Yes, Lot was saved, but what did he achieve? Nothing noteworthy or lasting. His life is a stark reminder that just being saved isn't enough. What we do with our lives also profoundly matters. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 15. But if any person's work is burned up by the test, he will suffer the loss of his reward. Yet he himself will be saved, but only as one who has barely escaped through fire. The angels try to hurry Lot and his family. Genesis chapter 19, verses 15 through 16. When morning dawned, the angels urged Lot, saying, Up, take your wife and your two daughters who are here, or you will be swept away in the punishment of the city. But he hesitated. So the men grasped his hand, and the hand of his wife, and the hands of his two daughters, because the compassion of the Lord was upon him. And they brought him out and put him outside the city. There was now no mention of the two sons-in-law. They are going to be left behind because the angels are telling Lot he needs to hurry up and get out of Sodom before it's too late. Think about how these angels are acting kind of like messengers who spread the good news or a warning. Here's what they did. They told them clearly and straightforwardly that a terrible disaster was coming. They didn't just tell him once. They kept on urging him to escape and save himself. Now, there's a part where it says Lot hesitated. Even though he knew how bad Sodom was, he still didn't rush to leave. This hesitation shows us something important. When we don't feel the need to listen to God immediately, especially when we know it's for our own good, it shows we might be too comfortable with things we should actually avoid. This kind of delay is a warning sign that we might be moving away from what's right and getting too used to what's wrong. The angels literally had to drag Lot out of the city early in the morning. Of course, the Lord was being merciful by sparing Lot for Abraham's sake. Lot, however, squeezed a concession from the angels even after he was delivered. He wished to visit the small town of Zor, which means a small one. This scene, however, would always remind Israel of Lot, lingering and halting as he was dragged to safety. Why do some of God's people join the corrupt world rather than flee a society doomed to destruction? In Genesis chapter 18, we read about a significant conversation between Abraham and God. Abraham steps forward and pleads with God to save the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah if just ten good people could be found there. Unfortunately, these cities were so corrupt that not even ten righteous souls could be found. Despite this, God listened to the core of Abraham's request. He showed mercy by rescuing Lot and his family from the destruction of Sodom. This act of salvation was so forceful that it seemed almost against Lot's own desire to leave. Now, let's consider Lot's situation. He found himself in a truly dire predicament. He was too attached to worldly pleasures to find joy in his relationship with the Lord. Yet he was too connected to the Lord to find genuine happiness in his worldly life. This story teaches us a vital lesson about where we find our contentment and how we must strive to balance our spiritual commitments with our earthly lives. Genesis chapter 19, verses 17 through 22. When they had brought them outside, one said, Escape for your life. Do not look behind you, and do not stay anywhere in the surrounding area. Escape to the mountains, or you will be swept away. But Lot said to them, Oh, no, my lords. Now behold, your servant has found favor in your sight, and you have magnified your compassion, which you have shown me by saving my life. But I cannot escape to the mountains, for the disaster will overtake me and I will die. Now behold, this town is near enough to flee to, and it is small. Please, let me escape there. Is it not small, so that my life may be saved? And he said to him, Behold, I grant you this request also, not to overthrow the town of which you have spoken. Hurry, escape there, for I cannot do anything until you arrive there. Therefore the town was named Zor. The angels were much more eager to save Lot and his family than Lot and his family were to be saved. This might seem odd, but it's often the case with spiritual matters. When Lot says, Please know, my lords. It shows us that he appears weak and almost whining in his plea, especially when we compare it to Abraham's strong and confident prayers in Genesis 18. We then learn, I cannot do anything until you arrive there. The statement addresses Abraham's question, 
Will not the judge of all the earth do what is just? Genesis chapter 18, verse 25. Far be it from you to do such a thing, to strike the righteous with the wicked, so that the righteous and the wicked are treated alike. Far be it from you. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right by executing just and righteous judgment? God, committed to his principles of righteousness and integrity, was unable to pass judgment on the city of Sodom until he ensured that the righteous individuals there were saved. As a result, the city came to be known as Zor, a name that translates to small or insignificant. That was the very city that Lot discussed and negotiated over with the angel. Genesis chapter 19, verses 23 through 26. The sun had risen over the earth when Lot came to Zor. Then the Lord rained brimstone and fire on Sodom and Gomorrah from the Lord out of heaven. And he overthrew those cities and all the surrounding area and all the inhabitants of the cities and what grew on the ground. But Lot's wife from behind him looked back and she became a pillar of salt. As the angel mentioned in Genesis chapter 19, verse 22, God's judgment couldn't start on Sodom and Gomorrah until Lot and his family had reached the safety of Zor. This was necessary to keep God's promise to Abraham intact. Once Lot and his family were safe, then the Lord sent down fire and sulfur on Sodom and Gomorrah. These cities faced total and harsh judgment, but only after God had fully seen their sins and acknowledged that Lot was there as a good man among them. Before all this happened, the land of Sodom was incredibly lush and fertile much like the Garden of Eden. Genesis chapter 13, verse 10. So Lot looked and saw that the valley of the Jordan was well watered everywhere. This was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. It was all like the Garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as you go to Zor at the south end of the Dead Sea. Despite receiving incredible blessings and witnessing amazing acts of kindness from God, the people of Sodom and Gomorrah still turned their backs on him. They experienced God's power, grace, and mercy firsthand, more so than any others in their area. Through Abraham, God saved them from disaster. They heard Melchizedek talk about God and saw how both Melchizedek and Abraham lived their lives, clearly showing God's love and care. Yet, they chose to ignore all of this. Remember what happened to Lot's wife. She became a pillar of salt because she disobeyed the angel's clear warning not to look back. Genesis chapter 19, verse 17. This story teaches us an important lesson. We should focus on the future and our salvation, not dwell on a world that's fading away and facing God's judgment. This is the woman that Jesus referenced in Luke. Remember Lot's wife. Luke chapter 17, verse 32. Lot's wife is an unnamed woman mentioned in the Bible very few times. She is a woman that met an untimely end due to her disobedience of the word of the Lord. The truth is we know more about the story surrounding the death of Lot's wife than anything else about her. Interestingly, the name of Lot's wife is not provided in the Bible, even though her existence contains numerous life lessons. We are not told why she turned back to gaze at the city while it was being destroyed. Lot's wife had every opportunity to live. Although Lot's wife is not named, we can make certain assumptions about her. She was familiar with the God whom Lot served, and she had Abraham as an uncle and might have learned a lot from him. She could have been present when her husband was kidnapped and saved by God's strength. She was exceedingly blessed to have God's angels in her home. They even took her by the hand and led her out of Sodom. But what good did it all do her in the end? All of God's grace was wasted on her. There are several key takeaways here. Number one, it is possible to be lost forever. Even though you are religious and have every opportunity to do right, you can come from a pleasing family, have many spiritual advantages, and still be lost. Number two, you can leave the world and begin on the correct path, but you will be eternally lost if you turn back. You are in charge of your own beliefs. But why did God care if she glanced over her shoulder at Sodom? Number one, looking back was an indication of doubt. She had to confess to God the penalty and fate of Sodom. He had spoken, and he would carry out his promise. We may declare that we believe God, yet when the test comes, we waver and look back. 
God invites us to put our trust in Him and turn our attention to spiritual matters. Number two, looking back was disobedience because God had clearly instructed not to look back. Go to the mountains and don't come back. There was no time allotted to hear all of her excuses or reasons for disobeying. That is why we struggle with the lessons of Uzzah, Ananias, and Sapphira. They expose justice for what it is and reveal God's stance on disobedience. Number three, to look back may have revealed her true attachment to Sodom. Was she displaying a love for what she was leaving behind? Her body was leaving, but her heart was still in Sodom. Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. James chapter 4 verse 4. Do we want to be friends with the rest of the world? This does not imply giving up everything in the world. This world represents everything that is opposed to God. The wickedness that was once part of your life. Lot's wife's punishment was terrible, abrupt and irreversible. She was denied another chance to flee when she looked back. All mercy that had previously been extended was abruptly withdrawn. The Bible does not go into detail about what happens, and it is exposed as a natural result of her decision. There will come a time when all of your opportunities to obey God will be gone. Some individuals scoff at preaching and teaching that refers to hell or any impending judgment. They perceive it as a scare tactic intended to frighten children and fools. We are too wise to believe it. More than any other subject, Jesus spoke about hell. His words inspired the images of gnashing teeth and unquenchable fire. Consider the innumerable examples of people who had the opportunity to do the right thing and then lost that opportunity forever. Pharaoh, Nadab, and Abihu, Korah and his gang, Judas Iscariot, and so on. To warn people about hell would be to fail to convey the entire truth, making us culpable in God's judgment of sinners. God appointed the prophet Ezekiel to be a watchman over his people. God provided him with a detailed work description. Lot's wife's lessons are still relevant. God is still ready to condemn all men, and his word is still to not look back. Will you flee God's vengeance in Jesus' blood? Let God's angels take you out of the city to safety. Genesis chapter 19, verses 27 through 29. Now Abraham got up early in the morning and went to the place where he had stood before the Lord. And he looked down toward Sodom and Gomorrah and toward all the land of the surrounding area. And behold, he saw the smoke of the land ascended like the smoke of a furnace. So it came about when God destroyed the cities of the surrounding area, that God remembered Abraham and sent Lot out of the midst of the destruction. When he overthrew the cities in which Lot had lived, Abraham felt the strong connection to the events of the previous day. He wanted to hold on to the memory of his encounter with God. As he looked at the smoke rising from the destroyed cities, Abraham understood that God had listened to his plea. Before the cities were destroyed, God saved Lot. Now, think about how a believer should feel when they witness God's judgment on the wrongdoers. Here's how they should react. They must accept God's decisions with humility. They must feel truly thankful that they were saved. They must be more careful about how they live their own lives. They must recognize how terrible sin is and avoid it. In the great destruction, the Lord overthrew the wicked cities in the entire plain with burning sulfur. Some believe that sulfur deposits erupted from the earth and then fell from the heavens in flames of fire. Lot's wife returned her gaze intently and was transformed into a pillar of salt, a memorial to her disobedience. The burning sulfur was responsible for the dense smoke Abraham saw. Though God judged the sinners in the plain cities, he also remembered Abraham, that is, God remembered Lot's request and saved Lot from the disaster. Lot is debased. Genesis chapter 19, verses 30 through 32. Now Lot went up from Zor with his two daughters and stayed in the mountains, because he was afraid to stay in Zor, and he stayed in a cave, he and his two daughters. Then the firstborn said to the younger, Our father is too old, and there is not a man on earth to have relations with us according to the custom of all the earth. Come, let's make our father drink wine, and let's sleep with him so that we may keep our family alive through our father. 
Lot and his daughters were not happy in Zor for reasons we don't understand. And it seems the people of Zor were not happy with them either. So, they decided to leave Zor and move to the mountains, where they lived in a cave. Despite losing everything when Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed, Lot and his family soon had wine. They either took the wine with them from their previous home or they found it in Zor. We read, We will lie with him, that we may preserve the lineage of our father. So, they made their father drink wine that night, and the firstborn went in and slept with her father. And he did not know when she lay down or got up. On the following day, the firstborn said to the younger, Look, I slept last night with my father. Let's make him drink wine tonight too. Then you go in and sleep with him, so that we may keep our family alive through our father. So they had their father drink wine that night too. And the younger got up and slept with him. And he did not know when she lay down or got up. And so both of the daughters of Lot conceived by their father. The firstborn gave birth to a son and named him Moab. He is the father of the Moabites to this day. As for the younger, she also gave birth to a son and named him Ben-Ami. He is the father of the sons of Ammon to this day. The Bible tells us about a time when the oldest daughter went to her father and they committed a sin together. This might make us feel uncomfortable because it's a bad thing that happened. But it's much better for young people to learn about right and wrong from the Bible, where bad actions are shown as bad, than to learn from rude words written on walls or from nasty stories. Everyone will find out about bad things at some point, but the Bible always makes it clear that God does not like sin and will punish it. It's strange, but true, that Lot, even though he was drunk, did the exact bad thing he had once talked about with the men of Sodom. He was with his daughters in a way he should not have been. They gave birth to boys, Moab and Ben-Ami, whose descendants were the Moabites and Ammonites, perennial enemies of Israel. Moab sounds like the words from father, and Ben-Ami means son of my kinsmen. These etymologies perpetuated for Israel the ignominious beginning of these wicked enemies. This chapter records God's judgment on a morally bankrupt Canaanite civilization but it also provides a severe warning against others becoming like them. It was difficult to get Lot out of Sodom and Sodom out of Lot's family. Lot was an upright citizen, hospitable and generous, and a leader of the community. Actually, he was a judge, for he was sitting in the gateway of the city. Judges usually sat by the city gates, public places where legal and business transactions were finalized. As a judge, Lot sought to screen out the wickedness of his town folk and to give advice on good living. He knew truth and justice, righteousness and evil. He was a righteous man. 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 7 through 9. And if he rescued righteous Lot, who was oppressed by the perverted conduct of unscrupulous people, for by what he saw and heard that righteous man, while living among them, felt his righteous soul tormented day after day by their lawless deeds. Then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from a trial and to keep the unrighteous under punishment for the day of judgment. Yet in spite of his denunciation of their lifestyle, he liked the good life of Sodom's society. He preferred making money off its citizens to staying in the hills where there would be no filthy living, but also no good life. Just like God saved a lot, he knows exactly how to save us from our troubles and temptations. And just as surely, he has a plan to deal with those who do wrong when the time is right. We should have full faith in God's ability to rescue good people because it's as guaranteed as his promise to judge the ungodly. We read, the Lord knows how. Let's be assured of this. Even when we're unsure of the way, God always knows. This truth is a solid foundation for how we live and what we believe. Think about it. Sometimes we encounter confusing teachings. For example, we might try to understand how God's control over everything fits with our ability to make choices. In such situations, it's wise not to dive too deep into these complex issues. If we go too far, we might get lost in confusion. Remember, God understands it all, even when we don't. Now, consider this. There are consequences reserved for those who do wrong. They are set aside for judgment day. However, those who believe don't face this fate. 
God promises to rescue us from the day of judgment and shield us from the anger He will release upon the world. This is a promise we can hold on to, a beacon of hope that guides us through life's uncertainties. Revelation chapter 3, verse 10. Because you have kept my word of perseverance, I also will keep you from the hour of the testing, that hour which is about to come upon the whole world, to test those who live on the earth. The hour of truth came with the visitation from on high. Lot seemed godly and pure, but he was hypocritical. His words were not taken seriously. The saint at first pitched his tent near Sodom, but later Sodom controlled his life. As long as the Lord left Lot alone, he would seek to profess faith while at the same time living in Sodom. Ultimately, he could not have both. Sodom would have destroyed him if the Lord had not destroyed Sodom. This story arc contains four major motifs. God's swift judgment, Lot's close attachment to the wicked society, God's merciful sparing of Lot from doom, and the rebirth of Sodom in the cave. Israel could see through these that if God judges a people severely, he is righteous because of their great evil. She could also learn the folly of becoming enamored with Canaan's wickedness. So, knowing how God dealt with the Canaanites, how should one live? The lesson is simple. Do not love the world or anything in the world. For the world and its desires, lusts pass away. 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 and 17 under the judgment of God. It is dangerous and foolish to become enamored with the current corrupt world system because it is doomed to God's swift and sudden destruction. In speaking to his disciples about a coming time of great destruction, Jesus mentioned what happened to Lot's wife and the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. Luke chapter 17, verses 32 through 33. Remember Lot's wife. Whoever strives to save his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life will keep it. If an unbeliever desires the best of this world, he will lose both this world because it perishes and life in the next. Luke chapter 17, verses 34 through 37. I tell you, on that night there will be two in one bed. One will be taken and the other will be left. There will be two women grinding at the same place. One will be taken and the other will be left. Two men will be in the field. One will be taken and the other will be left. And responding, they said to him, Where, Lord? And he said to them, Where the body is, there also the vultures will be gathered. Jesus also stated that if he had performed the miracles he performed in Capernaum and Sodom, the Sodomites would have repented. Matthew chapter 11, verse 23. And thou, Capernaum, which art exalted unto heaven, shalt be brought down to hell, for if the mighty works which have been done in thee had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. This indicates that God judges based on knowledge and that sinners will face a punishment greater than physical destruction. What does the Bible say about hospitality? Hospitality is all about making others feel welcomed and cared for. It means showing kindness and generosity to guests and even people we don't know. The idea of hospitality is like showing love to those who are not familiar to us. In the Bible, this wonderful quality is something God asks us to embrace in practice. It's mentioned many times, showing us it's an important way to live. In the Old Testament, God clearly tells us to be hospitable. Leviticus chapter 19, verses 33 through 34. When a stranger resides with you in your land, you shall not oppress or mistreat him. But the stranger who resides with you shall be to you like someone native born among you, and you shall love him as yourself. For you are strangers in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. While Jesus was teaching and helping people, he and his followers relied completely on the kindness and support of those they visited in each town. Matthew chapter 10, verses 9 through 10. Do not take gold or silver or even copper money in your money belt or a provision bag for your journey, or even two tunics or sandals or a staff, for the worker deserves his support. Likewise, the early Christians also depended on and received hospitality from others. Acts chapter 2, verses 44 through 45. And all those who had believed in Jesus as Savior were together and had all things in common, considering their possessions to belong to the group as a whole, 
and they began selling their property and possessions and were sharing the proceeds with all the other believers as anyone had need. Acts chapter 28, verse 7. In the vicinity of that place, there were estates belonging to the leading man of the island named Publius, who welcomed and entertained us hospitably for three days. In ancient times, travelers really counted on the kindness of people they didn't know. Traveling was risky. There weren't many places to stay, and most Christians didn't have enough money to afford them. So, they often relied on strangers opening up their homes not just to stay, but sometimes even to hold church services. Being hospitable, welcoming strangers into your home, was seen as a very important good deed, especially for those leading the Christian community. It was a sign of true leadership and caring. Titus chapter 1, verse 8, And he must be hospitable to believers as well as strangers, a lover of what is good, sensible, upright, fair, devout, self-disciplined, above reproach, whether in public or in private. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 2, now, an overseer must be blameless and beyond reproach, the husband of one wife, self-controlled, sensible, respectable, hospitable, able to teach. The author of the book of Hebrews encourages us to remember to never forget something important. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 2. Do not neglect to extend hospitality to strangers, especially among the family of believers. Being friendly, cordial, and gracious sharing the comforts of your home and doing your part generously. For by this, some have entertained angels without knowing it. Let's look into the story from the book of Genesis, where we learn about Abraham's kind and generous act of welcoming three strangers into his home. Despite being rich and old, Abraham didn't ask his servants to take care of these unexpected guests. Instead, he chose to serve them himself, offering the very best he could provide. And guess what? Those strangers were none other than the Lord and two of his angels. This teaches us about the value of treating everyone with kindness and generosity, just like Abraham did. Observe that after this, we don't hear anything more about Lot or what happened to him. It's very likely that he felt sorry for his mistakes, asked for forgiveness, and received it. However, the fact that the Bible doesn't mention him anymore teaches us an important lesson about the effects of drinking too much. When people drink, they often forget what they should remember. But there's more. Society tends to forget them too. Many individuals who could have been remembered with admiration and respect are instead forgotten or remembered with disdain because of their drinking habits. This should be a warning to all of us about the dangers of alcohol and how it can not only harm our lives, but also affect how we are remembered. This might be an uncomfortable story to hear, and you might wonder, why is this in the Bible? But it's much better for young people to learn about right and wrong from the Bible where bad actions are shown as bad, than to learn from rude words written on walls or from nasty stories. Everyone will find out about bad things at some point, but the Bible always makes it clear that God does not like sin and will punish it. It's strange but true that Lot, even though he was drunk, did the exact bad thing he had once talked about with the men of Sodom. He was with his daughters in a way he should not have been. They gave birth to boys, Moab and ben -Ami, whose descendants were the Moabites and Ammonites, perennial enemies of Israel. Moab sounds like the words from father, and ben -Ami means son of my kinsman. These etymologies perpetuated for Israel the ignominious beginning of these wicked enemies. The Ammonites? We find references to the Ammonite people throughout the early history of Israel. In the early chapters of Israel's story, we often come across the Ammonite people. These Ammonites shared a Semitic lineage with the Israelites. Yet despite this blood connection, they were more frequently foes than allies. 
During Moses' era, the lush lands along the Jordan River Valley were home to not just the Ammonites, but also the Amorites and Moabites. After Israel's exodus from Egypt, the Ammonites chose not to aid them. For this refusal to help, God rebuked the Ammonites. Yet when the Israelites were on the cusp of entering their promised land, God had clear directives. Do not provoke the Ammonites or engage in battle with them. I have not given you their land to possess, for I have allotted it to the descendants of Lot. Deuteronomy chapter 2 verse 19 The territories adjacent to the Ammonites fell under the domains of the Israelite tribes, Gad, Reuben, and the half-tribe of Manasseh, which were originally Amorite lands. Now the Ammonites adhered to paganism, venerating deities like Milcom and Molech. God explicitly instructed the Israelites to avoid marrying these pagans, to prevent them from falling into the snare of idol worship. Yet King Solomon didn't heed this warning and took Naamah and Ammonite as his wife. This sin even affected Solomon down the line. Consequently, just as God had cautioned, Solomon was lured into the practice of idolatry. The deity Molech was particularly barbaric. Depicted as a fire god with a calf's face, his outstretched arms ready to receive infant sacrifices. The Ammonites, reflecting the savagery of their deity, exhibited extreme cruelty. For instance, when Nahash the Ammonite was negotiating a treaty, he demanded the mutilation of each Israelite man by removing their right eye. Furthermore, Amos chapter 1 verse 13 condemns the Ammonites for their vicious acts, like attacking women with children in the lands they aimed to dominate. Under the rule of King Saul, the nation of Israel emerged victorious against the Ammonites, bringing them under Israelite control as subjects. Following in Saul's footsteps, King David maintained dominance over the Ammonites, and he even went as far as laying siege to their capital city to ensure Israel's firm grip on power. However, after Israel and Judah went their separate ways, the Ammonites started to forge alliances with those who stood against Israel, signaling a shift in their loyalties and strategies. As we move forward in time to the 7th century BC, we see the Ammonites reclaiming some measure of independence, but this resurgence was short-lived. About a century later, Nebuchadnezzar, a powerful ruler, conquered them, reshaping their destiny. During the time when Persia ruled the region, a man named Tobiah, who hailed from Ammon, is mentioned in the scriptures as possibly overseeing the area. Yet the community he governed was diverse, composed not only of Ammonites, but also of Arabs and various other groups. By the time we reach the era described in the New Testament, Jews had established themselves in the region previously known as Ammon, now called Perea. This integration mark significant changes in the demographic and cultural landscape. The Ammonites, as a distinct people, last appeared in historical records in the second century, mentioned by Justin Martyr, who observed their considerable numbers. However, during the Roman era, a notable transformation occurred. The Ammonites gradually merged with the Arab population effectively blending into the broader tapestry of the region's societies. They also gave birth to the Moabites. The Moabites were a tribe descended from Moab, the son of Lot, born of an unacceptable relationship with his oldest daughter. Their beginnings were in Zoar, a land nestled by the southeastern shores of the Dead Sea, wherefrom they spread their reach eastward beyond the Jordan River. 
As time marched on, the landscape of their world shifted. The Amorites, as when the Israelites embarked on their legendary exodus, they skirted Moab, traversing the rugged wilderness to the east, moving toward lands north of the Arnon. But the Moabites, stricken with fear at this migration, and their king Balak, felt a deep unease. In their distress, they turned for help to the Midianites, kindling an alliance against the tide of change. Let's focus on a truly remarkable figure from the Bible who originated from Moab, and her name is Ruth. She was born among the Moabites, yet she shares a connection with Israel through her ancestor Lot, Abraham's nephew, as stated in Genesis chapter 11, verse 31. Ruth stands as a powerful testament to how the Almighty can transform someone's life guiding it along a path he has sovereignly chosen. We witness the unfolding of God's flawless design in Ruth's journey, a manifestation of his divine intervention that he extends to all his beloved children. Despite her roots being entrenched in the pagan traditions of Moab, Ruth's encounter with the God of Israel was transformative. By embracing faith, she became a beacon of God's love and power, showcasing her devotion to him. Remarkably, Ruth, the woman from Moab, is acknowledged as one of the eminent women listed in the lineage of Jesus Christ, as noted in Matthew chapter 1, verse 5. This inclusion underscores her significance and the profound impact of her faith journey demonstrating how God's grace can elevate anyone, regardless of their past, to play a pivotal role in his grand narrative. How the Nephilim survived the flood, or did they? Origins of the Nephilim. Let us set the stage by understanding why the Nephilim were. In the Bible, specifically in Genesis chapter 6, verse 4, it says, the Nephilim were on the earth in those days. And also afterward, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men, and they bore children to them, those were the mighty men who were of old, men of renown. This brief mention has sparked endless debates and theories. Were the Nephilim angels, fallen beings, or simply men of great stature and power? In Genesis 6, there is a reference to the offspring that resulted from the relationship between the sons of God and the daughters of men. Notably, there were giants on the earth before the flood. They were remarkable due to the wickedness in their family lineage. The context implies that the Nephilim were the resulting offspring of spirit beings and humans. It is more accurate to see the sons of God as either demons, angels in rebellion against God, or uniquely demon-possessed men and the daughters of men as human women. Jude 6, and angels who did not keep their own designated place of power, but abandoned their proper dwelling place. These he has kept in eternal chains under the thick gloom of utter darkness for the judgment of the great day. Jude 6 also explains what God did with these evil angels. These beings were filled with lust when they saw the daughters of men and the angels cohabitated with the women, this producing offspring who were half angelic and half human, known as Nephilim. However, these beings would not have free reign on the earth. God was going to send a great flood, the great flood. Picture the world back then, full of life and busy with all sorts of things happening. But even with all this, there was a dark problem growing. The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was also evil continually. Genesis chapter 6, verse 5. People going about their lives, but something wasn't right. There was corruption, violence, and a kind of darkness that had settled over humanity. God then saw Noah as a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time. God tells Noah in Genesis chapter 6, verses 13 through 14, I am going to put an end to all people, for the earth is filled with violence because of them. Make yourself an ark of cypress wood. 
Can you imagine what Noah must have felt? Being given such a monumental task to build an ark, a giant boat, in preparation for a catastrophic flood that would wipe out every living thing. God did not intend for the human race to remain in this rebellious state indefinitely. This means that our rejection of God has reached a point of no return. God will not woo us indefinitely. There will come a time when he says, no more. The Bible gives us hints at a world that had deviated far from what God intended. So, as Noah builds his ark, a massive vessel about 450 feet long, 75 feet wide, and 45 feet high, you can feel that something really bad is about to happen. Let us put Noah's Ark's size into perspective with things we're familiar with today. Imagine a football field, which is usually about 360 feet long. Now, Noah's Ark, at 450 feet long, would be even longer than that, like a football field with an extra 90 feet, or about the length of another quarter of a field tacked on. That's pretty huge, right? For the width, think about a standard basketball court. It's about 50 feet wide. The ark was 75 feet wide. That's like one and a half basketball courts side by side. You could play a pretty big game on that. And for the height, it was 45 feet high. Picture a four-story building. Each story in a building is usually about 10 to 12 feet. So the ark was as tall as a medium-sized apartment building. Altogether, imagine a super long football field, one and a half basketball courts wide and as tall as a small apartment building. That was the size of Noah's Ark. It was like a giant floating building on the water. Continuing from the story, Noah gathers his family in pairs of all living creatures, as instructed by God. The Ark turns into a sign of safety and hope during the flood. Then the rains come. It's not just a heavy downpour. It's like the heavens themselves have opened up. Water covers the earth higher than the mountains. Every living thing that moved on the earth perished. Only Noah was left, and those with him in the ark. Genesis chapter 7, verses 21 through 23. After 40 days and 40 nights, the rain stops. The waters eventually subsided, and the ark rested on the mountains of Ararat. Now, think of this like parking your car on a big, tall hill after a massive storm. But instead of a car, it's a massive boat. And instead of a hill, it's a whole group of big mountains. Noah and his family step out into a new world. God makes a covenant with Noah, promising never to destroy the earth with a flood again, marked by the rainbow in the sky. You would think this would be the last time we read about the Nephilim or giants, but after this, we see various instances. The Exploration of Canaan It appears that the fallen angels committed their sin again after the flood. However, it is likely that it occurred to a much lesser extent than before the flood. We go to Numbers chapter 13, verse 33. Here we meet a new set of characters, Moses, the Israelite spies, and the inhabitants of Canaan, including the descendants of Anak, who are linked to the Nephilim. Who exactly were these descendants of Anak? The Bible introduces them during the story of Moses sending 12 spies to explore the land of Canaan. The spies come back with a startling report. We saw the Nephilim there. The descendants of Anak come from the Nephilim. We seemed like grasshoppers in our own eyes, and we looked the same to them. This verse suggests that the descendants of Anak were related to the Nephilim, known for their great size and strength. Moses, leading the Israelites out of Egypt, sends spies to scout the promised land. The spies come back terrified, saying, hold on. Didn't we just say the Nephilim were wiped out in the flood? In the Old Testament, giant is most commonly referred to by the word Rephaim. Throughout the entirety of the Old Testament's narrative, the Rephaim serve as a fascinating and significant reoccurring motif. Where does the Bible mention Rephaim? The Rephaim are first mentioned in Genesis 14. The Rephaim, along with other large people, are also mentioned in Deuteronomy chapter 2, verses 20 through 21. Deuteronomy chapter 2, verses 20 through 21. It is also regarded as the land of the Rephaim because the Rephaim previously lived in it, but the Ammonites call them Zamzumin, a people as great, numerous, and tall as the Anakim. But the Lord destroyed them before them, and they dispossessed them and settled in their place. 
the name Rephaim, which literally means terrible ones, gives us an indication of the intimidating and fearsome nature of these individuals. This is not the only time we see these giants after the flood. In Deuteronomy 3, there is an interesting story about King Og of Bashan, a giant man. Og is referred to as the last of the Rephaim in Deuteronomy chapter 3, verse 11, and later in the books of Numbers and Joshua. Rephaim is a Hebrew word for giants. In the days of Moses, Og king of Bashan was a mighty and infamous Amorite king of Bashan who reigned at Ashtaroth, who fought the Israelites on their way to the Promised Land. As the Israelites journeyed towards the Promised Land, they encountered many formidable foes, and King Og was one of them. He fought fiercely against the Israelites and led his entire army against them. Israel had to deal with King Og of Bashan, who sent his entire army against Israel. The Israelites then marched toward Bashan, where King Og confronted them at Edrai. Because of Og's reputation, the Israelites were terrified. Do not be afraid of me, for I have delivered him into your hands, along with his entire army and his land. God assured Moses. The book of Deuteronomy includes a narrative of a conflict that occurred between forces led by Moses and those led by Og. According to the biblical account, Og was the ruler of 60 different walled cities, all of which were taken by the Israelites. Israel slayed the entire forces and conquers all 60 cities in the kingdom of Og, which had the same tall walls at Sions. When God chose to hand over an enemy to his people, even strong fortified cities were no match for the enemy. In addition to this, he was a very large man and slept in a bed made of iron that was nine cubits long and four cubits wide, 13.5 feet long and six feet wide. The inclusion of this detail draws attention to Og's massive stature. A man in need of this size bed was most likely tall. Israel destroyed the entire population and took control of all 60 cities in Og's kingdom, which had the same high walls at Sion's. When God decided to hand over an enemy to his people, high-walled cities were no match. Later, at the city of Jericho, the most spectacular demonstration of that truth would occur. According to Deuteronomy chapter 3, verse 11, Og was a descendant of the Rephaites, indicating a man of great stature, or giant. His colossal bed had become famous and, no doubt, had been saved as a memento. Joshua chapter 12, verse 4. And the territory of Og king of Bashan, one of the remnant of Rephaim, who lived at Ashtaroth and at Edrai. After this, we then see another giant. The most well-known giant in history is Goliath from the Bible. He was a champion from the Philistine camp who fought as an armored charioteer. He was dressed in what we'd call a mail coat. The Philistines warmed up by donning a large canvas-like undergarment with overlapping bronze ringlets. From shoulder to knee, this coat of mail shielded the weaver from the enemy's weapons. Body armor of this size and type weighed 5,000 shekels of bronze, which equates to between 175 and 200 pounds in modern terms. The armor only included the coat of mail. Goliath, on the other hand, wore a bronze helmet, bronze leggings, greaves, to protect his shins, and carried a bronze javelin or spear slung between his shoulders. Was Goliath a Nephilim? Some scholars believe that Goliath the Gittite, a Gath resident, belonged to a race known as the Nephilim. Other experts argue that Goliath was a Rephite, because the Nephilim were destroyed in the Great Flood during Noah's time. Only Noah's family survived. Some scholars believe the Philistines descended from the Anakim. Goliath's champion status is enhanced by the fact that Gath was an ancient Anakim stronghold. Some scientists believe Goliath has an identifiable family tree, implying autosomal dominant inheritance, which causes familial acromegaly, or gigantism. The relations of Goliath. There are also other giants mentioned in 2 Samuel chapter 21, verses 15 through 22, and 1 Chronicles chapter 20, verses 4 through 8, who are related to Goliath in the Bible. This event occurred when David was old. 2 Samuel chapter 21. There was war at Gath again, where there was a man of great stature who had six fingers on each hand and six toes on each foot, 24 in number. He also was a descendant of the giants. And when he taunted and defied Israel, Jonathan, the son of Shimei, David's brother, killed him. 
These four warriors were descended from the giant in Gath, and they fell by the hands of David and his servants. Since Goliath was from Gath, these were Goliath's sons or brothers. How did they survive the flood? But here's the big question. If the Nephilim were around before the great flood, and the flood wiped out all but Noah and his family, how could the descendants of Anak, which are linked to the Nephilim, be around after the flood? When we consider the flood, we read, He blotted out every living thing that was upon the face of the ground. Genesis chapter 7, verse 23. This verse makes it clear that the flood was incredibly comprehensive in its destruction. So, how could the Nephilim have survived such an event? There are different opinions to this. Some suggest that the Nephilim mentioned afterward in Genesis were a new group unrelated to those before the flood. Others propose that the term Nephilim might not refer to a specific lineage, but rather a title or description given to giants or mighty warriors against different eras. It's also possible that after the flood, the demons mated with human females again, resulting in more Nephilim. It's even possible that some Nephilim characteristics were passed down through the lineage of one of Noah's daughters-in-law. Another perspective comes from the book of Numbers, chapter 13, verse 33, where the Nephilim are mentioned again long after the flood. The spies sent by Moses to spy on the land of Canaan reported, There we saw the giants. The descendants of Anak came from the giants, and we were like grasshoppers in our own sight, and so we were in their sight. This passage suggests that neither the Nephilim or a similar group of giants existed post-flood. So, did the Nephilim survive the flood, or were the post-flood giants a different group altogether? As we think about this mystery, it reminds us of the many interesting stories and people in the Bible. It makes us want to learn more, ask questions, and be curious. Based on a few theories that Bible scholars and enthusiasts consider, some suggest that Nephilim might not have referred to a specific group of people, but rather was a term used to describe any large and mighty warriors. So, the descendants of Anak might not have been direct descendants of the pre-flood Nephilim, but were simply similar in stature and strength. Another idea is that something similar happened again after the flood. This time, the sons of God came down to earth and created a new group of Nephilim, this could be why there were giant people, like the descendants of Anak in Canaan. A less popular theory is that the gene for the Nephilim somehow survived through one of Noah's family members. It's a bit of a stretch, but some people think that maybe the wives of Noah's sons carried this gene. In this perspective, the story isn't about physical giants, but about moral and spiritual challenges. The giants represent the significant obstacles the Israelites had to overcome in their faith journey. So, how do these pieces fit together? On one hand, we have Noah and his family, the sole human survivors of the flood. On the other, centuries later, there's a mention of the Nephilim or their descendants in Canaan. Flood, but continuous sin. So why did God send the flood if he knew sin would still be around after it? Let's dig into this using Genesis chapter 6 verses 1 through 7 as our guide. One thought is that the amount of evil that happened in Noah's time was incredibly high, way more than usual. It wasn't just regular evil, it was non-stop, all-consuming wickedness. Maybe our world today, with all its problems, still doesn't compare to how bad it was back then. Another thought is that the whole situation with the sons of God, the Nephilim, and their offspring was super problematic. It's like the flood was specifically targeting this extreme form of evil that had developed. There's a bigger picture here. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 11 tells us these stories are warnings. Jesus even talks about the days of Noah in Matthew chapter 24, verses 37 through 39, saying that just as people back then didn't see the flood coming, many people won't see his return coming. So, the flood was a massive reset button for a world drowning in sin, but it was also a warning sign for future generations. It's like God saying, Look what happened back then. Don't make the same mistakes. God knew the flood wasn't going to solve the problem of sin forever. That's where Jesus comes in. The flood was part of a larger plan that would eventually lead to Jesus coming to deal with sin once and for all. Colossians chapter 2, verse 15 talks about how Jesus defeated the powers of evil. In the end, God's plan is way bigger than just the flood. 
He's looking toward a future where there's no more sin, no more pain, a new heaven and new earth. As Revelation chapter 21 verse 1 says, the flood was one step in that plan, a hard reset in a time of unimaginable wickedness, but also a signpost pointing us toward the need for a savior and the promise of a better world to come. Spiritual warfare. The Nephilim and the Great Flood are more than just ancient stories. They offer valuable lessons in spiritual warfare that are relevant to us today. Just like the Nephilim were part of the physical and spiritual problems of that time, we too face challenges that aren't just physical but spiritual. The union of the sons of God and the daughters of humans resulted in chaos, showing how stepping away from God's path can lead to serious consequences. In the same light, when we go against God's will for our lives, it can result in a significant impact on our spiritual lives by relying on God's power. So, when we read about the descendants of Anak being linked to the Nephilim, it opens up a whole world of questions and interpretations. It's like piecing together a puzzle with some pieces missing. In other words, the Bible invites us to explore, to wonder, and to seek deeper understanding. The Flood Story, which talks about the mysterious Nephilim, fallen angels, and how evil had engulfed the earth, is a really powerful story about how people are judged, how they can be saved, and how good people stay strong. It makes us ponder, how do we remain faithful in a world that often seems to be drifting away from moral and spiritual anchors? These stories teach us about the challenges of faith, the reality of facing giants in our lives, and the importance of trusting in God's plan. The Israelites, upon hearing about these giant descendants of Anak, were terrified. But this fear tested their faith and reliance on God. In our lives, we might not face literal giants, but we encounter our own descendants of Anak. Big problems, fears, and challenges. Like the story of the Nephilim and the descendants of Anak, these challenges might seem overwhelming. But just as the Israelites were called to trust in God and face their giants, we too called to have faith and confront our fears. The Bible encourages us to look beyond the surface, to seek understanding, and to find strength in faith. So next time you're up against a giant, remember the story of the descendants of Anak and the mysterious Nephilim. It reminds us that with faith, even the biggest challenges can be faced. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as we gather in your presence today, our hearts and minds are filled with wonder and curiosity about the mysteries of your creation, especially the story of the Nephilim and the Great Flood. This ancient story, surrounded in mystery, speaks to us about your power, your justice, and the enduring strength of faith in the face of overwhelming challenges. Lord, we acknowledge that just as Noah faced the vastness of the flood, we too encounter floods in our lives, floods of doubt, fear, and uncertainty. We see the giants in our own world, challenges that seem impossible to overcome. And we often feel as small and powerless as the Israelites did in the shadow of the Nephilim. Yet, through these stories, you teach us about resilience and the power of steadfast faith. We pray for the strength to face our giants, not with fear, but with the courage and conviction that comes from knowing you are with us. Just as you guided Noah to build the ark and lead the Israelites toward the promised land, guide us through our struggles and lead us to a place of peace and stability. Father, in the story of the Nephilim and the flood, we are reminded of your sovereignty over all creation. You are the master of the universe and nothing is beyond your control. Teach us to trust in your divine plan, even when it's beyond our understanding. Help us to remember that, like Noah, our faith and obedience can become a refuge in times of trouble. We ask for wisdom, Lord, to discern the lessons you want us to learn from these stories. Let us not get lost in the details, but find the deeper meaning and the moral guidance they offer. In the story of the Nephilim, may we see a reflection of our own spiritual battles and the importance of standing firm in our faith. Lord. We pray for humility, to accept that there are things in this life and in your word that we may not fully understand. Just as the mystery of the Nephilim and the flood stirs our curiosity, let it also deepen our faith. May we embrace the mysteries of our faith with a heart open to learning and a spirit willing to be led by you. In moments of doubt and confusion, when we feel overwhelmed by the floods of life, remind us of your promise to Noah, a promise of your faithfulness and love. 
Let the rainbow be a sign to us too of your covenant, a reminder that no matter how great the flood, you are always with us. God, we ask for the courage to be like Noah in our own world. Grant us the integrity to stand for what is right, even when it sets us apart. In a world where things are always changing and we're not sure what will happen next, let us be like bright lights showing everyone your never changing truth and love. Give us the strength to build our arcs, lives grounded in faith, hope, and love, so that we may weather any storm. As we reflect on the story of the Nephilim and the flood, it inspires us to look beyond our fears and doubts. Encourage us to see every challenge as an opportunity to grow stronger in our faith and closer to you. May these ancient stories continue to teach us, guide us, and remind us of your eternal presence in our lives. Finally, Lord, we ask for your blessing on each person here today. May we leave this place renewed in spirit, fortified in faith, and inspired to face our giants with courage. Help us to remember that with you, nothing is impossible, and no flood is too great to overcome. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.